Hi, if anyone's out there, we are holding tight until 3.15 and the AHAC meeting will begin at 3.15. Thank you.
kind of share. That's interesting. <laughs> some, the amount of parks. I don't know. Share, it's all you like. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Apologies on being 15 minutes late this afternoon. We had uh, some other activities that took up the first 15 minutes, um, but we'll roll right into it. Um, Dean, have you had a chance to get rolled? Yes. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, we'll start off by starting with public comment. Do we have anybody? Nope. Nobody. All right. Um, next item on the agenda is the approval of uh, February's minutes. Has everybody had a chance to review? And are there any questions, revisions, anything like that that need to be taken care of? I'll move to approve the minutes. I'll second. All right, we have a motion and a second. Um, all in favor, raising your hand. Looks like it's uh, there nobody online today. Uh, nobody online. Yeah, we have our first. several first people are like missing three years. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we have lots of sickness and lots of people missing today. So, um, Amy, do you want to roll into the shelter update? I would be delighted. Thank you. I'm here with the shelter update. Good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> so, I wanted to start with the statistics. Whoops or jump around a whole bunch. I'm on a new computer um, with the overnight shelter. And especially during February, you can see that there was quite a bump yet again. We're at 116%. Um, last week, they were up to 138 at Shepherd's House one night. So you can um, imagine for a facility that was really intended to serve mo no more than 100 people, that they are bursting at the seams. And you can see that one of the places that it may have affected um, that, that number of people affected services is that we did not see as many transitions um, to more permanent housing in February. It was also a shorter month, but um, if that continues to be a trend, we'll certainly call everyone's attention to that. Um, what that means at the shelter, and we're talking about over on Second Street, is that folks are on the floor in the day use area. Um, sometimes there's not um, always clean bedding. They may have to bring something in um, versus being in a bunk and, and being guaranteed some a little bit of space of their own. So um, over at Stepping Stone, um, we were lucky enough to have the open house um, last month. And I think you can see a couple of AHAC members there in the crowd. We're very excited to announce that 27 families are living in those 28 units with one more family on the way. And um, it's it's going very well. It was a smooth transition into the new facility. And um, all new bedding, all new um, furniture. We had an unfortunate incident where we needed to throw away all of the previous mattresses, but that's who wants to sleep on a mattress that's been around mm -hmm. since 1948 <laughs> anyway. So um, <laughs> all new mattresses, all new bedding. Um, we have ADA ramps and bathrooms, as well as um, blankets and pillows. And some of the units do have kitchenettes. Were you getting any donations for those things? No, we were able to de-scope the contract. Neighbor Impact utilized other funds and so at a great savings to the city. And so it was actually funds from Neighbor Impact that we pulled back out of the contract. Um, if we had perhaps greater capacity within housing or, or at Neighbor Impact, that would have been a great idea. So maybe on the next one, if there is one, we can make that public call. Yeah, you know, I I did quite a bit of work for Habitat back in Sonoma County, and they had a group of women that made quilts for all of the people that moved in. And there might be a similar organization okay. here that would be interested in in doing that, and also um, soliciting uh, clean bedding and so forth. So there might be a way to let the community get involved and feel some ownership in that. Thank you. We have had um, a terrific response from some of the motels in the community that when they have sheets that for whatever reason are mm -hmm. hotel quality, but still um, usable, mm -hmm. they have donated those, um, especially the campfire. That's a motel has been really, really outstanding mm -hmm. and um, even comforters and things like that. So we definitely appreciate mm -hmm. that they have stepped forward that way. And then, of course, we have um, the Franklin Avenue Shelter, which is the former Rainbow Motel. Um, there are 50 uh, units right now, and it is a vacant 
And so it is not being utilized when folks move to Stepping Stone um, and Neighbor Impact move that program over. At some point it may be used by Shepherd's House, but, but right now we do not have a shelter running out of that building. And a temporary outdoor shelter, we're still working on Bear Creek and 27th site. They're moving dirt. So we're hopefully going to have those pallet shelters up um, very soon. Question. Go ahead. Yeah. So the Franklin Avenue shelter, is it that there's no one that can run it? Or what's the, I would think there's still the need. So I'm there is curious. absolutely the need. There is um, some question as to how to fund that location. Mm -hmm. And we do have an operator, Shepherd's House is willing to step forward and operate there and how um, the parties that be negotiate a contract to make that happen sooner than later is um, something we hope to see. <clears throat> and is uh, some of the governor's initiative that's coming down the pike, could that provide any funding? Is there an application? for? There is. Like There's an inquiry that the city did um, put in. I will say that those are specifically the shelter beds are for new beds. Most of the dollars, um, my understanding, mm. are for preventing houselessness. Mm -hmm. And so the shelter piece of it, or what I'm hearing from the state, the shelter piece is really the smaller piece of it. They really want to work on preventing households from entering into the system. And so we would need to call these new beds in order to access those funds, which we can. I mean, the rainbow is, is vacant and empty and it would be a different provider. So we are exploring all options. We have put that inquiry into um, CYC, which is collecting that information. So mm -hmm. hopefully by the next meeting, we'll have an update. Mm -hmm. They're targeting, I believe they want um, the city of Bend for, to put in 84 beds. And how many beds are available at the, at the front? There are 50 units. Some of those units are fairly large. It's really funky in the front. And then in the back, it's it's much more modern. It was built in the 80s. And so you've got some really small rooms in the front. And then you have some rooms that you could almost consider an apartment. It's got a very limited kitchenette, but it's got a separate bedroom. So it's almost an apartment layout. Mm -hmm. So um, there would be room in, for families there, <clears> which would be nice. And, and we definitely saw that previously with Neighbor Impact. And Kathy, what, what I don't track it much, but what I've heard is that they don't, they don't, that new money is not supporting the service provision or rental assistance mm -hmm. for, for that, for the big pot of money, which is, seems to be a dramatic need. That seems like that's where the, but. Yeah. Was there plans to, I know that there was kind of some movement going around as soon as Stepping Stone was finished, the people were going to move from Franklin Shelter to Stepping Stone. Mm -hmm. And then were there renovations also planned for Franklin at that point as well? No, there are no renovations <clears throat> planned for the rainbow versus just if we needed to paint something um, that was purchased as an investment by the city. It was not purchased and please correct me <laughs> um, as an investment for redevelopment later, whether that is a city hall or has some component of affordable housing or a public space. And so it's not for houselessness purposes, but we do recognize that it's a, a 50 room motel. So it's different than the turnkey funding. And so we thought we might as well use it while we could. And it has a three year like provisional use permit on it right now to use as temporary shelter, correct? Maybe even longer, yes. Okay. And I think Lynn popped out and yeah. there she's going. I saw her on there. Yeah. I just asked her. Oh, uh, sorry. I was just going to sort of um, build off of what Keith said. I hope you guys can hear me okay. Um, the priorities for the funding are being determined locally through the Homeless Leadership Coalition, uh, and COIC is sort of standing up that effort. So different folks who are interested have been able to take surveys and things like that. It is moving extraordinarily quickly. So if you haven't seen the survey, please don't take that personally. It's just a matter of sort of continuing to move things forward. Um, but there's been a number of projects um, submitted. Rental assistance, in my understanding, is available. It's just a matter of whether the larger group prioritizes that to send it on to the state. So, or is an eligible use in my understanding. So not everything that's eligible is going to get through. And so we'll see. One last. Um, well, because the uh, second street shelter is so overwhelmed with people, mm -hmm. it just seems like the overflow from there could potentially go here. Um, but Absolutely. And um, th the issue becomes the increased 
cost of having the staff at two locations. And, and Shepherd's House is absolutely willing to explore that. They're very comfortable with congregate shelter and non-congregate is a little bit out of the box. And so they wanted to craft a program that was similar to Neighbor Impact, supported with the same staffing levels. And so there's definitely a desire or an interest. It's just a matter of um, meeting that financial. You know, I, I think that's what the community needs to understand. You know, they say, oh, why don't you put people here? Why don't you put people there? And it's like, well, there's nobody to monitor it and take care of it. And, and then the funding sources are so few and far between. And it's frustrating to think we've got this empty motel and we've got people who need space. But yeah. <sighs> Thank you. Very much so. Um. So we are moving along on the temporary outdoor shelter at Bear Creek in 27th. Like I said, they're moving dirt. So hopefully um, about eight weeks, six to eight weeks, we will see those pallet shelters up. And then Keith, they took your um, feedback and I've created kind of a shelter cheat sheet. Thank you. And um, <laughs> <laughs> what I just wanted to be sure is that I'm encapsulating the information and I, and I will send this to everybody in word format um, I didn't know if you wanted like budget information or funding sources was my main question, or if you'd like any other information. No, that looks good. Lo location and how many how many are offered, right? That's okay. um, that's just me. I don't know what what else you guys might want. Well, Christy. funding funding if if it's a for a limited time, you know. Oh yeah. When guess, does the funding yeah, cut yeah, off? You know, I mean. If it sunsets, yeah, that yeah. that makes sense. Um, Keep doing these three-year contracts and so sure. that all, but I can definitely include that. Um, I probably on the safe parking sites, I won't put all of the addresses. Oh yeah, don't. Um, because those are some um, yeah. communities of faith and, and specialized populations right. um, being mm -hmm. served. But just know that there are six safe parking sites. Um, Reach is working with folks there as well as Central Oregon Villages and um, actively looking for other safe parking sites all the time. So um, we are looking at hiring someone else to assist with shelter and that will be one of the priorities is to, to see if we can find other small places up to six is usually how many folks can be there and most of them are our two um, site locations. Not to jump backwards much, but you had mentioned that Shepherd's House does have interest in potentially managing the site at Franklin if funding sources could be yes. put together. Um, have they indicated what kind of funding they would need mm -hmm. in order to satisfy that? Yes, they produced a budget that's very similar to the budget that was put forth um, by Neighbor Impact in conjunction with that location. Okay. And so it, it's produced all, it's 800,000 plus okay. 450 units. And those 50 units, like I said, could have two people in them, one person in them. Um, for the city's purposes, we always count units is one bed, even though we're well aware that it may be a family. Right. And that's annual. Pardon me? Annually. Annually, yes. And that includes 24-hour um, a day oversight and support, which is usually um, a security company in the evening is how that works at all of our shelter locations right now. Well, great. Thank you so much for the information. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Um, we do have potential SDC exemptions. We need to start by rolling into conflict of interest. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess we can start do you, do, and just go down the line. Does anybody have any potential or real conflict of interest that they'd like to share? Gosh, you guys are making this way too easy this time. <laughs> Um, does everybody have the um, information regarding the SEC exemption? Do we want to discuss it, Rachel? Oh, so sorry. I don't I know if you need to or not, but. <laughs> Wake up. Um, no, I was just trying to get my screen to share with you all, but maybe I'll just do this verbally because it's just a little slide of the um, language that you have in front of you. So SDC exemptions are a SDCs, I should say, system charge. Sorry, <laughs> system development charges are one-time fee on development with increased need of existing infrastructure. 
The fee is intended to recover costs of existing and planned water, sewer, and transportation expenses. The Affordable Housing Advisory Committee becomes the or became the approving body for SDC exemptions for affordable housing developments in 2017. Prior to 2017, City Council approved these exemptions. The Affordable Housing Advisory Committee makes recommendations to the Bend Parks and Recreation District to consider SDC waivers for developments approved for SDC exemptions. And with that, today we are um, or have in front of us SDC exemptions for Central Oregon Villages, which is a 20 transitional housing unit development. Um, each unit will be 100 square feet with two to four bunks, and the site is located on Desert Streams Church vacant lot. There is a shower bathroom trailer and no connection to water or sewer. Um, the mobile office or counseling building will be in a yurt, um, and there will be on-site um, services from the Central Oregon Villages um, organization. Are these like pallets? Mm -hmm. These are pallets. Why would SDCs be in for something like this then? That's a very good question. <laughs> but we don't want to hold up the process. So that. we are bringing those in front of you. I, yeah, it, I, I share the same kind of right. rhetorical question of why is it costing $220,000 to put something that's not connecting to sewer or water? Right. They're impact <laughs> fees, right? The, it, well, it's transportation not, in parks. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and that's yeah. That okay. So I, I'm glad that we all have the same kind of big question mark. There. Yeah, I was looking Elizabeth at that. Elizabeth has an like, answer. Incredible. Oh, hi, hi everyone. <laughs> yes, we did look at this, and the code um, for SDCs discusses when they are assessed. And um, as you noted, there are no water or sewer um, SDCs being assessed, but because of the types of work that are happening on the site to allow the the placement of the pallet shelters, that was the trigger um, as determined by our code for assessing um, those transportation fees. Um, I can't speak to parks, but that I, I don't have any information on the parks fee, um, just that we are taking it through our process. <clears throat> Question on that. So these are kind of pallet shelters, so they're temporary, essentially. Um, if someone were to erect a teepee in their backyard for their children, would they be subjected to the same transportation fees? So I believe I was told by CEDD staff that it was the type of permit that was pulled for, I think, the grading work to get access to, you know, physically transportation access to the site of the grading and the driveway that was needed. Um, I don't have all the information on what was involved in that permit, but that was the trigger. I think permit is the answer. If, if it's something that requires a permit, then it's going to trigger that evaluation probably. Yeah, I do know that there is kind of an access point snafu for this that they were trying to so i guess that does make sense but yeah it's just two hundred and twenty thousand for 20 10 by 10 pallet shelters is incredible i would <laughs> i would i would love to to i don't know if city staff or who can do this but the the we're, we have a limited number of parks waivers and it would be very interesting to to delve into their process to I mean and this is going to take 20 out of the 75 for this year right they so, have, I can answer Lynn go ahead. Have, thanks for this the, this, the this would not department. this would not impact our cap so they recognize oh okay. cool okay yeah. well that, yeah, that's yeah. helpful it's just yeah. more paper than than yes okay all right gotcha okay yeah but it's still a hundred and thirty four thousand. oh I know. <laughs> I know I know so so this I mean so it's more of a um that this yeah i think they recognize then that this is if, if they're taking that that's yes cool, that they, yes this is a yeah. special kind of oops they're bringing a resolution in front of their board for this <laughs> exception okay yep. okay much better much I much just, easier to swallow i stood at this piece of paper for like 11 minutes today and i was like <laughs> something's <laughs> not adding you know <laughs> yeah and then yeah the tp was like uh-oh <laughs> can't be doing that for the kids um I'll make a motion. Go for it. Um, I would move to exempt Central Oregon Villages from the pending City of Bend system development charges of $86,260 and authorize staff to take all actions necessary to complete such exemptions, including signing 
loan agreements, and related documents without further approval. If exemptions are not exercised before any expected increase, the increase will be added to the total exemption. I'll second. Uh, we have a motion and a second. All in favor? So I'll make a motion for the second one. I move to recommend the Bend Park and Recreation District Executive Director or designee waive Central Oregon Villages from pending Bend Park and Recreation District system development charges of $134,440. If waivers are not exercised before any expected increase, the increase will be added to the total. I'll second. Uh, we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Recommendations pass. Um, next on the agenda is a presentation from the uh, Ben Redmond Habitat for Humanity. It looks like we have Scott and Dee Dee. How's it going, guys? Thank you for having us today. Is this, can you guys hear me okay? Uh, my name is Dee Dee Johnson. I'm the VP of Homeowner Services for Bend Redmond Habitat for Humanity. And this is Scott Nordquist. He is our grants manager and um, was formerly in the department with me when we did these listening sessions. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that. We may have Penny um, join us who is running a little bit late and stuck in traffic, but um, he's uh, the executive director of the Fathers Group. So if he jumps in, we'll pull up another chair. Um, we have some brochures that we'll leave with you today, but we wanted to go over some of the findings from our listening sessions, which was the against racial disparities of home ownership. But we want to give some special recognition to uh, community partners that made this possible. So first to the Central Oregon Health Council for funding the grant, and then to our listening session group hosts, uh, the Fathers Group, Latino Community Association, and then Embrace Bend. And especially now, um, Melissa Kamanya who's now with you, who was my former co-chair um, of the DEI committee and who's responsible for writing the grant. So um, thank you. Yeah. Um, we got one more slide for you. Um, before I jump in, I want to say I'm usually tuned into these virtually. <laughs> <laughs> So I will jump in to a little background of this project. Um, we began with a de desire to understand bias and challenges, especially in the Black and Latino communities. Our team realized before we could do that, we had to do some DEI work. So in 2019, we were awarded a grant from the Central Oregon Health Council. Uh, Scott, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Can you speak into the mic a little bit more? We're getting yeah. some things from folks at home. Thank you. Okay. Um, COVID slowed down that um, process, but we hired a DEI consultant and formed a committee consisting of staff, um, volunteers, board members, and uh, Habitat homeowners. Um, so eventually in 2022, we were able to hold these listening sessions. Fathers Group and Latino Community and Embrace Bend. Um, so taking the feedback from the listening session, jumping past a little bit here, um, we were awarded another grant from the Central Oregon Health Council, credit building workshops. So that is something we are working on right now. It's a year long program. This group to do credit building. Um, and then even more recently, just last month, we were awarded a grant from Habitat for Humanity International for advancing Black homeland. Really excited. We were one of only 12 affiliates that could be So yeah. and the only one in the world. So mm -hmm. exciting um, for us to continue some of this work. And that's where we're at right now. We'll give you some more on what the listening session is This slide shows the um some of the varying households, well, Black and Latino households, that they're less likely to 
own a home compared to the rest of the state in the country. And, and we also know that in our rural communities, Black and Latino applicants with incomes of $75,000 and higher had denial rates for home purchase mortgage applications. They had higher denial rates than our white, than white applicants. So in 2004 and 2000, 2008, the denial rates for whites was 17%, while Black and Latino applicants were one and a half to two times more likely to be denied. Hmm. So we'll see in So onto our data collection, we had 47 participants in these listening sessions. Um, same questions were asked to all three different groups, they different categories, um, interest in home ownership, safety, bias, and barriers to home ownership as well as some central um, It's a little small, but if you can see, for the bottom of the slide is we also had a voluntary survey with some demographic info. Um, just know there's a lot of unknown or undisclosed. And I would say that's common feedback that um, just gaining trust in the community can be a challenge and getting folks if they don't know how it's going to be used it is, is a challenge. Um, we'll you'll get a we'll give you a, the brochures and it'll go through a little bit more of the, the findings. But as you can see from the slide, um, these were quotes that we heard from people that redlining is still a mindset. Um, that there's too much bias in homeownership if you don't look like the seller. My rent has increased thirty five percent over the last four years, but my income has not and that more funds are needed for down payment assistance. And I would add that I think that um, we've seen that systemic racism has been embedded in our financial system, and it has mostly impacted historically disadvantaged people of color, as seen through the inability to own property, redlining, uh, and limited access to credit. While these are still getting a little bit better, there are still issues and in our credit building system. And so you Think of those examples of being, you know, payment history, such as paying your bills and utilities on time, doesn't have an impact on their credit, but not paying them has a negative impact. And for the findings, more of what we heard were that the income limits are too, too strict. We need um, more higher and lower income limit. Um, Again, Scott mentioned the Central Oregon specific feedback, critical infrastructure behind um, our roads is needed, not more than just nice parks. Um, and that there's a strong interest in home ownership and in credit building workshops. So we took a lot of what we were hearing and we've already kind of jumped into some of that too. For you guys. Um, and I should back up and say that during these listening sessions, they were hosted by um, those organizations. Habitat was essentially no to. Um, so moving, moving forward, what we tried to do is, is collect some of the feedback in general. Um, some movement on what we could do with the feedback. Um, so one large one that we heard consistently that folks were interested. I can say one interesting example that came at the state level is a new down payment program where there's tier of funding for first time home buyers and a second tier for first generation home buyers. It's not a minority specific down payment fund, but it is the state's attempt to have to receive those funds, and I'm excited to partner with culturally specific agencies. Um, we are doing that, and that can be challenging. Those um, agencies are being pulled and sought after by a lot of different groups brings us right into joint events. So 
what Habitat has done is start to work more collaboratively with other housing builders um, so that we are utilizing. We'll show you, we can share a flyer, but we have first of its kind to use spearheaded a housing information thing. First one's in Redmond next Thursday. We have four builders. We have new boom. That's kind of the exciting work that we're trying to get these um, different groups so we're all presenting out in the community. Um, I, I think it probably goes into what you were seeing even earlier when you were speaking that um, program funding is really needed. Um, Kenny is like the voice for everything and he's everywhere, which is probably why he's, you know, late <laughs> trying to get here too. So he's just pulled so thin that we need more support to, to fund programs and the people that run them. So, um, but I'm excited too to be, to be partnering. It took that uh, relationship and is taking that relationship with him to build trust. He's the voice, right? And so as we did, and I partnered with David Empire in our first credit building workshop, um, it, it took their trust to bring us into their location. And that always felt like it's a very privileged place for me to sit in my chair, in my office, and expect people to come to me. And I don't wanna, I don't wanna be doing that as much anymore. I wanna be out in the community with our partners doing this kind of work it has the most impact. We're very grateful for our partnerships. We get to questions too. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thinking of maybe um, right. a couple more. I think moving along here. Um, other feedback using <clears throat> local clients. So um, you'll see. We'll send you with them. We've got real we'll have to. Um, more funding for staff to support more driven this building. Credit building um, was a consistent um, issue in all, the, all three listening sessions. That's why that was one of our first actions. We to um, move in. Next slide, please. So, um, and this is the last slide too. So we we also heard um, we want to see and ensure that we have BIPOC representation in planning and, and decision making, including zoning changes, more funding to support workforce and middle housing, AMIs, um, funding for educational events, uh, media programs for underserved populations in Central Oregon, and not leaving affordable housing to the last phase of the development when we're approving things. Buyer programs for I-10 holders, and I know Matt knows a lot about that, and some of the work that you know, we're still trying to push forward there. I will say, I don't know if you saw it, but um, there's an ex interesting example of a minority specific program that was recently in the news and it was funded by a private donation to assist black home buyers in the Seattle Habitat for Humanity program. And they're gonna pay up to $50,000 of their debt after the buyers finished half of their sweat equity. So, you know, if any That's private huge. donors <laughs> wanna do that, I thought that'd be pretty amazing. <laughs> yeah. uh, but a, a pretty amazing example of, Didi, what is ITIN? Oh, um, individual taxpayer identification number. So somebody oh. who doesn't have a social mm -hmm. um, and wants to pay their taxes. And um, I know that um, Latino Community Association is actually helping people sign up for ITINs right now. So it's a big part of the process. Mm -hmm. And they're at the same time giving them our uh, information sessions for the upcoming um, LCA credit workshop. So we'll have. Um, language interpretation and, and kind of moving in that direction in April. April 11th, right? There's two of them coming up in, in April. Okay. So, and then we're also doing another joint housing information session, very similar to the one that we're doing in Redmond this month, having one at LCA in Bend um, 17th, I believe. Wanted, we can just jump in questions and I will hand out the deck to there's some meeting with some brochures. Yeah, yeah, you had mentioned the mm. historical systemic discrimination planning process, whether it be from the lending side or from 
you know, on the solving side. What kind of strategies or did you develop strategies to perhaps start looking at that here locally and how that might play out? Question? Um, we have not yet. You know, this is we're, we've just kind of gathered this information and put it together and are starting to work with our partners on that. So open to and asking for um, feedback on how people want to start working together on that. Um, um, yeah, so other other yeah. ideas that us and um, four other developers are working on. So we we have to work within the parameters for us. Um, for us, we take applications, so we can do different things to get prior uniforms to do applications. Um, so one idea that I think Core has done is um, it's an authored by a partnering agency. Um, another thing we could do is so like this on payment assistance for first generation home buyers. So what's that? Denied. What's that? Can yeah. applications still be denied? We yeah. can get them to a better place, and that's kind of why we're trying to focus a little bit on the credit building side of it, because then we're not really doing housing counseling, although it, that all comes up as a part of it. But um, if we're focused on where we're doing our credit building opportunities, then hopefully we're building up their opportunities as well. Okay. Slow process, and I, you know, Matt, you might know more on you know where we're at with ITINs and approving those for loans. But I... Front lines trying to fight it. There's very limited options, and um, it's it's all about it, it, a lot of it doesn't make a lot of sense, and it's all backed by money. Essentially, is what it comes down to. Um, the dam is starting to break, though. I can say that it just hasn't caved in yet. Um, yeah. I, I think doing things together rather than have coming to you as a, um, you know, funding is always competitive, but I think you're going to start to see more partnerships happening. I think we need to play well with others, and I think we need to be out there where people feel comfortable, and uh, we're starting to do that together as a team, and that feels really good to me. I'm, I'm pretty, pretty proud that all the affordable housing groups are working together on this so, so well. I mean, it comes down to arguing about what is the right Spanish word for affordable and there's three different things. You know, so it's fun. I mean, I think we're we're doing it. <laughs> so we're doing the work together. That's encouraging. I would I, I would imagine you'll be closely tracking you know, when folks do all of these things, right? Who gets approved? And and I would also assume that you would, would also be building strong relationships with, with filters and and other lenders uh, to sort of build awareness around some of these issues. I'm just, I don't want to see all this happen. And then at the end of the day, folks still aren't getting all this. Right. And, and I think that that tracking- That's where is, the discrimination comes in. Right, is, is important. And so um, for me, I know with, with the credit building workshops, we're doing a pre and a post survey and we're tracking that information as well. But in terms of like how they get into housing after that is, that's kind of another level of data collection, but we, as we're working together and sharing our information between, and we have waivers that are helpful for us to be able to do that as the affordable housing builders, I think that's Go ahead. Um, I wanted to ask you, it sounds like you're working with Neighbor Impact and their credit program, because when you mentioned it, I thought, are you coordinating with them? And you are, so that's good. And how you said you're you're doing joint events and cooperating with all the different organizations so you can learn from each other and not duplicate efforts and spread the efforts around. Um, I know we recently passed the uh, construction excise tax that we are able to use from our city councilors. So gratefully let us use for programs because we identified that funding for programs was one of the biggest gaps that we had. And I don't know if any of the other communities that you work in, like one that starts with an R maybe, would be interested in doing something similar to, you know, recognize that funding for programs is a real big problem. <laughs> You'll need to present to them as well, I think, and try to work that into the conversation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they are gratefully, they're, they're graciously giving us the space to do this um, housing information fair so it's a great door opening and we're mm -hmm. having more and more conversations um 
Well, and, and, you know, everybody's growing rapidly. Everybody sees the homeless issue. Everyone sees people being put out of their rentals. I mean, I think it's something, it, the time is right, right? But I think um, for the communities to really understand where the gaps are, you know, like in our circumstance, we have this motel sitting vacant right now, but we have no funds to pay anybody to make it work for our homeless community. Um, it's crazy. And so uh, unfortunately in bureaucracy, oftentimes people throw things thinking they're addressing the issue, but not looking at it in depth to really realize, okay, we'll target what, what specifically is needed. So, so that program um, issue, I think is one that you can't emphasize enough, I guess. <laughs> I, think you're, I think you're right, I know you're right. Having done some follow-up meetings already um, with some of the folks that are coming, it's, it it's takes up double my time for certain clients because they just never, and then we heard it. I mean, in the first credit building workshop that we had, we just never got this. We didn't, we didn't get this in our household growing up. Um, we didn't know this, that, you know, they, they didn't know that, you know, credit bureaus were, you know, they're private agencies and they're, you know, so they just are fearful and they, you know, are saying, I don't, I don't know what this is, you know, and so, you know, I'm having to handhold a little bit more, mm -hmm. um, definitely need, um, more team members mm -hmm. to do it, mm -hmm. um, but I'm, I'm grateful for the partnerships with with neighboring putting clients and. Mm -hmm. um, That's yeah. great. Well, thank you for all that you do. It's been great to have to to grow the relationships. Really, it's... do you have people in your organization that speak Spanish or that are bilingual that can help? Um, Yes, he was in my department, and <laughs> I did just hire someone else, and she starts at the end of the month. So, mm -hmm. um, yes, we do. Not maybe not enough, but um, we're we're growing it as well. It was an, it was a, a and what we're seeing too is that you know from a DEI lens, those people need to be paid more, and um, Habitat was able to support. Oh, great. Good, great. I was in Madras last week passing out the flyer and there is a massive need for this in Spanish in that area. Um, I don't know, I, I like kicked a bee's hive when I was up there passing it out and I'm expecting a pretty decent turnout next week. Yeah, I think uh, that's not our uh, service district. It's area, not, but it is. that's why I went there, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. are stretching out there a little bit and doing what we can. Um, I think that happened when Kenny and I met the first time too, and yeah. we brought him in and we started talking about, oh, I'd love to do some credit building. And he just jumped out of his chair and was like, the board was just talking about this and this is so needed. And uh, so it just kind of, we just started it. You know, we just kind of went after it and you're right, it's, it's a huge. So there are statistical data that support um, BIPOC mortgage loan and credit denials. Is that kind of the fo the reason for the focus behind the credit building workshop and, and there? Because did you have any statistics as to why those denials happened? Were you able to look into that? No, we didn't go that deep into it. I have I do have some and I have seen a lot as well. Um, we listened and that's what we heard. And the so credit building is key. Yeah. When we just heard that over and over locally um, it's key. in our region. Yeah. I'm yeah. excited that that is something that you guys are going to be able to do. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you for having us. You guys are lucky to have you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Speaking of Melissa, <laughs> you're next up um, with the consolidate or actually the funding allocation debrief. Given council goals, we are not okay. I have a huge act to follow. Here, so. <laughs> um, yes, the first thing I'd like to talk about really briefly is uh, last week I sent out a survey to all the AHAC members to talk about the recent funding allocation process and. Um, Everybody's feedback was very uniform, and the only issue that came up that we will be addressing 
is the need for a purpose statement or a clear way to identify how much uh, an applicant is asking for and specifically what their project is. So I heard from most of the folks that responded that you're able to find that information in the budget, but we're going to put it much higher up in the application so that it's um, easy to identify. Um, with that, I, I cannot wait to talk about the consolidated plan. <laughs> Do I have permission to share my screen? You should have it. No water to do that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Ready to have one of my coughing attacks? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just getting, I've been talking too much. I'm getting drunk. All right. Um, so I'm here to talk to you today about the 2023-2027 consolidated plan, specifically some priority updates. All right. So the consolidated plan is designed to help assess affordable housing and community development needs and market conditions. We also use the data to make data-driven decisions for setting our goals and priorities. It does use multiple data sources. So I, I mean, have looked at data. I've been with this department for two months and have looked at data for two solid months. So I know these sources um, quite intimately, right? There's HUD data, um, U.S. Census data, there's also local sources like the point in time count that looks at the homeless population. A few things about the data. Um, the data is a five-year average, so it's not a specific point in time. It averages five years, and so it's five years behind. So when we're writing the con plan or the consolidated plan for 2023 to 2027, it's a five-year average from 2015 to 2019. I know there were some interesting things that happened from 2019 to 2023 <laughs> in the housing market. So that just keep in mind, it is a five-year average. And also, I want you to know that when I'm presenting this information to you, I didn't just look at the, those five years, but a lot of what I'm about to talk to you about is a comparison from the previous con plan, which was looking at data five years before 2018. So we recognize that it's all a little bit behind, but it still has a really powerful story to tell. And when possible, we do look at some more recent data, such as data about our, our homeless population. Okay, so I think you know me by now that I just, I love data. Um, <laughs> I just love it, tell us great stories. So as I mentioned, we were looking at the last con plan to this con plan, and some really interesting trends we're seeing. Um, the number one trend that we saw was cost burden specifically on our lowest income earner households. And so cost burden defined by HUD is um, cost burden families are those who pay more than that 30% number, 30% of their number on housing. Just like a little um, pause there, it's not just your rent or your mortgage, it also factors in your utility. And when you pay more than 30%, you have difficulty affording certain necessities like food and clothing medical care. So for the sake of HUD, they describe you pay more than 30% your cost burden. And if you pay more than 50% of your income, the fund data begins. So this chart is comparing the number of households with that 30% cost burden. The blue line is uh, the 2018 con plan. The orange line is the 2023 con plan. So that Orange line is the, the most recent data that we have. And you can see there's a significant drop in the number of households, specifically with the lowest cost burden. So those first bars, if you can see, is 0 to 30% of the area median income, then 30 to 50, then 50 to 80. So what does that mean? Well, we might think, based on what we know of our housing market, that maybe those households that dropped off at that huge drop off from the zero to 30% income range, you might think they moved to having a higher cost burden because we know that the housing market has gotten more expensive. 
So if that's true, my next slide shows the higher cost burden. We would expect to see it, that same magnitude of increase with the higher cost burden. That is not what the data is showing. While we do see an increase um, here in this first part at the zero to 30% AMI range, we do see some increase. It is not enough of an increase to cover the magnitude of the drop from the previous slide. And if you look at the higher incomes, 30 to 50%, it even went down a little bit. So cost burden is not the whole story. Well, so can you just remind me of the blue bar is 2018? That's when we submitted the 2018 consolidated plan. So it was five years averaging before that. And then the orange And the bar. orange is the, the plan that we're submitting right now. I see. Okay. Yeah. And 30% is cost burdened, over 50% is cost? Severe cost burden. Severe cost burden. Okay. So we spent a lot of time looking at the data and wondering, well, where did those lower income families go? In other words, what's happening to them? Logically, there's, there's a few options to talk about. They could have increased their income and reduced their cost burden, but if you are income earning zero and if the area needed income, um, that could happen. Maybe not, we don't know the magnitude that that has happened. Likewise, they may have moved from the area, um, but if you are in that income range, it's really hard to have enough money to move the area. Um, maybe they moved into alternative housing or entered into houselessness. So more looking at data. Comparing the last time that we did the consolidated plan, these 2018 numbers to 2023 averages, we see that we have lost 1,638 units who are lower income earners. This is a blend of naturally occurring affordable housing, which means it's not subsidized, and it could also be subsidized housing. I don't know exactly the blend here, but doesn't mean these are units that are no longer in bend. It's just because they have become so expensive that they're no longer affordable. So there's fewer options for our lower income earners. Likewise, this slide, I'm showing you crowding. This is a little different way to look at data than the last slide. So this is the percent of change from the last consolidated plan to this consolidated plan. And crowding is what happens in unaffordable housing markets where new households fail to form. I think you may have heard the term failure to launch. That <laughs> happens when um, a young adult doesn't leave their parents' home. Well, that is one of the things that can happen when an 18-year-old cannot afford to go out and find an apartment to rent. It could be other things like um, we hear the term doubling up. So maybe your mom and dad come and live with you or your sister's family. But there's also non-familial crowding, which is when you take in a stranger and rent out one of your rooms. So this chart is homeowners only, and that we're seeing crowding, an increase in crowding for all the homeowners at all the ranges of income. And that orange bar there is severe overcrowding. So that's more than 1.51 people per, per room. So it is showing that there's some alternative housing happening. Overwhelmingly, the number one issue that we, we've seen that we want to talk to you about Look at all the slides I've just shown you. There is some magnitude that's showing, okay, maybe some of those low-income earners are living in alternative housing. Maybe some have left the area. Maybe some are finding more income. But all of that together doesn't make up for that magnitude of drop that we saw with those that 0 to 30% income earners that have gone off the charts. What we do see, and this data is from the last consolidated plan to the most recent point in time count that I have, we have a 165% increase in sheltered houseless residents and a 373% increase in sheltered houseless residents. Very concerning. Um, often assumed when people see statistics like this, we'll hear, um, well, it must mean that we have migration to bend. Mm. These can't be bend residents. These must be people coming from out of town to be homeless here. What the data is showing that it appears to be local residents recently entering houselessness. So from the point in time count, um, we saw that 50% of the people counted as houseless were houseless for two years or less. And of those who responded, where is your previous address or where did you live before you became homeless? 93% were Central Oregonians. 
So these are our local residents that in the last two years, as housing has become expensive, dropping out of not being able to afford rentals and entering into this. This is wonderful that you did that. I love data, so it tells me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what I'm ultimately presenting to you all today is that we have a data-driven change in priorities. Uh, our number one priority in our consolidated plan that we're drafting right now is our houseless population. And the priorities that we're setting are for more shelters and beds, more social services, and more prevention. Uh, our number two priority is our affordable and available rental units with more units and more assistance. And those go hand in hand, specifically houseless prevention and rental assistance are essentially the same thing. If we can give people rental assistance so they don't need their housing, we preserve their rental housing, we prevent homelessness. Um, and then other priorities that we are still establishing um, and have a place in ranking yet are homeownership and social services and infrastructure and emergent needs. So um, love to answer questions. Go for it, Kathy. Is any of this information being um, or, or planned to be brought up to the governor's office, the state level, because they're the ones with the funding to potentially do something here locally that it takes a while for the Fed money to come through. And they're talking about this right now. I see Lynn is going on. She's going to answer me something. But <laughs> I think having this kind of very clear data is not something that everybody has or is, has done the deep dive to produce. And I think it's very compelling. I think it's very clear what is going on. And I think, like you said, so many of our people in the community that are housed think that these are all people coming from someplace else. And um, I think it just needs to be said into their faces that this is not the case and that you know we have to deal with this. But I, I'd like to hear what Lynn is having to say. So the governor, <clears throat> excuse me, um, via Oregon Housing and Community Services and the Oregon Emergency Management Office has set up sort of a comparable, very fast track prioritization process. So it looks a lot different than this and is a lot more superficial. I think um, what we can control is sort of what we're spending our own funds on. And we will continue to work on um, educating the legislature and other um, elected officials on what our needs are and how that might differ from other parts in this state. So certainly doing a lot of that work, um, but as so far, we have not had the opportunity to provide this specific feedback directly up the chain. Hopefully that helps, Kathy. Yeah, I, I think it does need to go up the chain, though, because not everybody is doing this. And I bet if they took the time to do what you've done and look at each individual city, they might come up with a lot of the same same result. And uh, yeah, I'd like to talk to you more offline about trying to get the information out to the community at large. I think we should have a press conference for that data right there. Yeah, yeah. You like know, we're changing the NIMBY attitude that we see. Yeah. You know, I sit on the Bulletin's editorial advisory board, and so what I was going to suggest is that we meet with them and, and discuss this. So that it's they've already been doing a lot of really good series on this, but I think this is something that has to be repeated often and brought up in different ways yeah. and in different venues to really communicate out there. Uh, yeah. It's good timing because we are on the, the heels of a 30 day um, public comment period for the consolidated plan. Mm -hmm. And so um, don't have the exact date of when that will start, but there'll be 30 days where it's available to draft in the full form. Um, over 100 pages. So if you have some spare time, <laughs> this is the cliff notes that I presented today, but the consolidated plan has a lot more information and a lot more detail. And so perhaps that would be an opportunity to get the information out as well. Yeah, but a lot of people don't read 100 pages. I think the Cliff Notes version is probably, you know, more important to get out there so that it can be easily digested. And you all will get the consolidated plan in the next week or two um, because we'll have a public hearing on it um, at the next AHAC meeting. You're, you're recommending some shorter 
FAQs and summaries and things like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Not yeah. Just putting out the 100 page document. Correct. Well, I mean, you could put out the 100 page document. You In have addition, to put have it out. To. But I think if yeah. there could be a one pager almost that just very concisely condenses what you've just given us and with graphics for the people who are more visually and also in Spanish, maybe. But I think it would be great to just be able to get this out there as broadly as possible um, to the community. Great. As just a observational comment, um, I find it interesting that HUD has statistics and, and, and areas where people become severely housing burdened, but they're home ownership loan program allows for people to acquire homes above mm -hmm. the severely housed burden level. So it's, they want to address something, but they're allowing it to happen. Anyway, my own observation. You're writing loans for more than 60% of FHA loan program can go above 50% huh? off of the gross income. How did you become so data driven? Born this way. I think it tells a very compelling story and um, it reflects what I think we all have known to be happening, but having the data really uh, makes a much stronger case than it oh, yeah. reveals. And this is also the community feedback um, council received from Bend in its statistical significant survey. So um, we knew this was the number one priority. We just needed to kind of condense it so it was more palatable to you all. And um, Melissa was great at doing that. So. Was it the number one priority, I wonder, in that people didn't want to see increased services towards houselessness or was it a number one priority in that they wanted something done because I, I i really want to champion this cliff's notes version because i think it's going to shift some mindsets of a significant amount of residents in our area um, to where it would still be a number one priority but maybe how that priority is looked at to be resolved would change in a more constructive manner one can help I, I really want to champion that that Cliff's Notes version. That thing is awesome. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. I did want to just say um, regarding the community uh, survey that City Council presented in, in the, their listening session in January. Mm -hmm. um, the number one need that the community identified was uh, the need for more services for the houseless population over everything else, over affordable housing, even over. Um, public services. So the community is hearing what we're saying, um, and that there's there's tremendous support for that. Cool. I have a question. I don't know if this is for you, but I'm, and this may be um, premature. But I'm sort of thinking about how we, as a committee, recommend use of the dollars that we have, and I imagine that. Adopted and submitted that we would see a shift in how in the types of projects that we fund. We need more construction excise tax. Funds. Yeah, so that's the problem. We're limited, aren't we, with the F, um, the federal funds? The public services are capped yeah. for CDBG funding, and so um, I believe we are presenting to council on March fifteenth the construction excise tax recommendations, and um, also we'll be explaining that uh, the fund is. Um, not performing as projected and um, we'll hopefully have some more council direction on where that should go from there. Um, just really quick note if it's okay. Um, if there is an AHAC member who would like to join Melissa and I in discussing some of those proposals and what you all have been discussing today, I think we'd be welcomed or we'd welcome that and would be happy to prepare you and 
um, and have you join us for that presentation on the 15th. So um, that's a little preview, I guess, of what's coming potentially in staff report, but uh, just give a shout if that's something of interest to you. Thank you, Bob. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. Carrie, you're next. <laughs> Middle income housing report. Chair, committee members, and I'm not sure how I follow Melissa. <laughs> you have statistics and data. Yeah. <laughs> you're the opposite of it. You're the opposite. Yeah. <laughs> Anecdotally, yeah. <laughs> this is what I hear. Yeah. <laughs> Response can help with the crowding situation, right? We want all our, all of our kids to be able to move back to the city event when they when they leave after college. So we'll be working on this. Um, so I just have some notes of an update, really, just a brief update for you of what we've been doing. Um, uh, middle income housing um, and uh, middle housing. So the two, they interplay, right? They're two different things. The missing middle housing and the type of housing, uh, cottage, uh, fourplex, all the plexes, um, and um, middle income ho uh, housing, obviously, is the standard 80 to 100. So I want to um, just kind of throw out a few things uh, for you to know that we've been addressing with the middle, the missing middle. And that is that the, um, we've been working really closely with the Building Safety Division. They've been partnering with the Housing Department to um, make sure that we move some programs forward pretty quickly. Um, the master reissue permit process is moving forward. If you if you weren't aware, just wanted to give that update that the Building Safety Division um, had announced in a pillar meeting that that should be um, coming to fruition. Um, so that's really good news. The pre-approved ADU plan program that we've been discussing, that is also moving forward. We have the building officials. Um, I have been collaborating on how we might roll that forward um, in a phased process basically to, to launch the program and then from there move forward with some options. But the goal is to um, make sure that we're getting all the tools and toolbox out there to access. Um, and so uh, basically going to meet more with some administration staff and see how we get that up and, up and running and then come back to the drawing board on how we might um, improve. Duplex, the duplex conversion promotion um, is also something we've been working on. And that's just to say that, again, an ADU um, and building safety terms, building code, an ADU is a duplex. We don't know speak um, in the building code. And so um, really wanting to help make sure that folks know, besides the detached ADU option, we have um, detached duplex ADU option as well that we want to promote. Um, and that's just to encourage, or and if you're thinking of the idea of the public, if that's an option for folks, um, how simple it could be. It's not necessarily the simplest thing, but um, we're going to address some of the key items, um, which is straightforward fire life safety, um, separation, and then uh, in the, um, in the sanitation. So this is, um, in, in our view, uh, low-hanging fruit that um, is not one in, one in and of itself going to make an impact, but altogether, um, we feel that as we continue to pluck away at these items that... So middle income TAC, technical advisory committee, was a goal that we discussed last time. Um, and that has been formed. There's a few members um, on this committee that have stepped forward as well as some other community members. And I just want to let you know that that uh, team has been formed and we've met twice. Um, and we have, we dove into the um, approaching the idea of launching an RFP for the limited funds that we have available. And um, in that process, we determined we needed a lot more information. So a team of six, we would need a much bigger team to just come up with a straight RFP out of that team. And we want some help in community 
um, as well as employers and any other partners that we can bring into our effort. And so we are going to move to uh, very quickly to an RFI process um, request for information, which will preclude the RFP process. And so um, I'm currently working on that to bring back to the CAC and then that form next week to tackle. So forward quickly into it. Um, I think um, something else that was discussed a bit by the TAC was the funds amount that we have available to us isn't a huge significant amount. Um, and so it's not something that you can just apply to a development project and, um, you know, get a huge bang for your buck or huge impact. And so we discussed a lot of the idea that it, this, this could be, this could be pilot type, right? This, this could be, it's, it's, I'm going to exaggerate, but if it was for a unit or a few units, if it was successful, if we could more funds, um, model a bit more in other areas. <laughs> duplicated information over the week. Are there any questions? Is there a place that the minutes are being posted that we can take a look at? I think the minutes um, are not posted publicly because it's not a public, public. meeting. Yeah. So, um, but it's a isn't it a isn't it a ad hoc of this group or no? It's not? Mm -hmm. so, the TAC is a technical advisory uh, committee uh, that advises staff, and then staff brings TAC uh, to AHAC. It's very separate, and it's. Reasons, but it definitely isn't an extension. Our meetings aren't held, uh, they're not public meetings, and so they're not held in that form. Mm -hmm. There's an agenda. Um, not sure. There's an agenda and there's, there's records of the meeting. So mm -hmm. I don't know if I'm taking minutes, but they're not public, but I'm sure you could talk to Lynn or, or. I was just yeah. hoping to learn more about. Yeah, those yeah. Kind of stuff. we're not trying to be secretive. I just don't know what the policy <laughs> is around that. Yeah, there was something we would post public, but they yeah, are not yeah, sure. back if you would like me to bring back more detail if you if you would like more than um you know yeah we're open to how we bring that information back to you even if it's not a posted minute style I have to know the handshake though <laughs> yeah. and, the, and the password it wasn't intended to be secret if it's just not very formal I just wanted to add a little to that and Matt maybe you want to too but uh, we we talked about it it's only with four hundred thousand dollars, so right. <laughs> you can imagine that doesn't go very far. And so we talked about, well, maybe it could be a revolving fund if it was a loan. But <clears throat> it, the, if we did loan it and it get paid back, it goes into the general fund, and there's no guarantee it would come back to us to continue to do the program. And so then there was some very creative discussions about, and I think Matt would be a better person to describe this, but maybe to create a kernel of something that shows the city is wanting to do this, that it could draw other funds and create a bigger fund. I don't know, Matt, did you want to say? Yeah, it, it was kind of to touch on what Carrie had said, like if, if we could show that this is something that can be a successful branch or even option in the middle market, that if it could be duplicated with additional funds, um, approaching the private sector as well for additional funding into this revolving high in the sky massive fund um, to where we don't have to necessarily go to the city every year for additional funding. It could be something that could be public and private. Um, there could be prioritization on certain projects, depending on, you know, what it is and how much money we got in and so on and so forth. But it, it's, there was interesting discussion that was had on a different level that really, I mean, I was personally excited. I was pumped up on the meeting. Like I was, I never even thought of stuff like this before. And, um, but it, it was a, it was a robust conversation about potentially creating something legally um, that, that could fund itself. Right. I mean, we were trying to not be one and done, <laughs> right, you know, yeah. Because four hundred thousand dollars is not even right. one unit. So you know, it's it's how do we 
how do we think about that in a different way, potentially, of, of just kind of throwing out a lot of ideas of mm -hmm. what could we do to, to, to get the biggest bang for your buck and get success and maybe grow a fund <clears throat> and as opposed to just, well, when we fund a couple of ADUs and then it's out the door and gone. So, you know, we're trying to be creative. Let's just put it that way. I had a quick question. I was curious about, you'd mentioned one of the ideas was to create a pre-approved ADU or a, a, a pre-approved pre plan. Oh, yeah. Uh, so it's similar to a master in a plan program. It would be a plan that's it's already approved. Uh, and you would make that. We have a plan that's been provided uh, free of cost. Uh, we're looking into other options for additional plans um, from an existing um, pool. That's just an effort between the building safety division and designers. Um, and then there's also other programs and other jurisdictions that we're looking at where um, architects, designers have participated in um, the program in a way that you can also uh, select those plans off the jurisdiction's website and purchase those. Um, so you can you can see just as I described that that there's there's kind of a simple format that that it's a menu. Kind of, there's a menu that you can do. Yeah, yeah. Let's just go choose this one. Okay. No, that's it's it's been a topic of discussion in our multifamily world forever, but. Multi-family housing is very different, and I could see it working much better for, for like an ADU to be. Mm -hmm. I think that that would break mm -hmm. down a barrier for a lot of people if they had, if that's something they could look at instead of going through process. Really scares people sometimes. So um, we remove that barrier. So that yeah, you remove that access, barrier and be yeah. like, I, you know, it's going to a, it's going to Home Depot I like that. You know, mm -hmm. and so um, that's a it's fantastic. So we idea. did talk about the fact that every lot is different and. Yeah. You well, know, that let's you not have, complicate it. You, but, have yeah. to have, you know, and a lot of people have a five foot side yard and how do you, you know, yes. access and there's just a lot of issues. And we also talked about architects don't want to be thought of as not having value, you know, and, and not being, you know, at work isn't supposed to always be free, but that there are ways of, of addressing. I, I think it's worthwhile looking at, but I, I don't want anyone to get their hopes up too high that it would be all that helpful, you know, depending on the circumstances, but, but having people looking at some, there are um, modular companies that, that have a lot of plans that they have, but it's like, you know, modularly getting something into somebody's backyard is not always easy. So yeah, there are some developers that are looking to gain a foothold in the central Oregon area that have restructured models mm -hmm. and, um, geared towards low to moderate income households. Um, they're just looking for partnerships. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, the city of Eugene is one example that we looked at that has uh, ADU plans that you can purchase. Um, and some of them were quite fancy. So. Uh, <laughs> they also have the free plan option. Yep. Um, and some of the designers, I've reached out to the designers in that jurisdiction, that jurisdiction, and other side of those those plans. Um, so there's a ton of conversation happening. The way we're hoping to phase this is let's get some let's let's get the free plan that we have. Let's let's get the program launched, and then uh, we the next phase of that is what we have in the front of us, what we have already reviewed and approved there um, expanding the program to whatever whatever it could be. There's been discussion. I know that in the building safety division, they've always been interested in even being able to provide uh, garage plans. And as you know, a lot of times if you have room on your lot for uh, a detached garage or an attached garage, um, you can put a dwelling of the garage. And so there's discussion there of how we might um, expand that. So I'm pretty, I'm pretty pleased with um, the work that the collaboration between the building safety. Awesome. And, and even you talked about uh, converting one's garage, one's two car garage as well, because you're talking about a duplex type of approach. I think um, 
I think probably the more intimidating thing for people is sewer hookups and, you know, the city providing information on how that can happen, um, metering and so forth. Um, you know, it, 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 you can you can get a Home Depot shed and pocket in your backyard, but how do you hook up a bathroom? You know, that the bathroom kitchen condition is the thing that I think scares a lot of people. They don't know how on earth are they going to do that. And, you know, the costs involved in that is... Exactly, and that's been the goal. Um, is um, like a, a flyer type format, right? And you can go to the building safety division webpage and really simplify the things you need to look at. Mm -hmm. Things as well. Like shutoffs, do you need to shut off from um, <laughs> the other unit or access to that shut off, that type of thing. Mm -hmm. And our goal, um, as I work uh, with the assistant building official, is is to create something that that even simplifies that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. These, these are the things you need to consider for the right. layman's terms. I need mm -hmm. to go in to more detail. Yeah, it's not an answer for everybody. It's not something all of us yeah. are interested in, but it is something that. I think uh, certain cities in California that instituted the conversion of their two car garages into units saw a much bigger uptake of that than trying to put a unit in the backyard or something like that. So mm -hmm. I think that is something that most houses in this community that are detached homes have, a lot of them have a two car garage, you know, and, and a lot of them have a three car garage so they can keep one garage and convert it to, because 400 square feet works just fine for an ADU. Um, so I would encourage that moving that duplex discussion forward is a is a really fertile ground, I think, to do that. Thank you very much. Yeah. Appreciate it. Doing well on time. Uh, Rachel, staff report. So there's not a whole lot to report. Um, the Central Oregon Council on Aging or Council on Aging of Central Oregon is now, I believe their new name, is having a, ridding, a ribbon cutting ceremony on March 23rd to open up or celebrate um, a lot of their um, rehab and uh, renovate uh, efforts. They would like anyone to attend, uh, especially considering like we're supporting those last phases. Um, they intend to, um, I think, asphalt and do some ramp work with the funding that um, you have all recommended be awarded. And so they would love your attendance. They haven't given me a time or set a time or made a time public. So all I know is that it's March 23rd. And when I know more, I will send it out. And then um, I would love Matt to give kind of the update on is it a housing fair that's happening? In yeah, it's just more information what Scott and Didi were talking about. Um, the housing informational fair that's being held in Redmond um, next Thursday, the 16th at, or when? Yeah, Thursday, the 16th, <laughs> sorry, at 5.30 p.m. Um, I have flyers on the door for anyone that would, or at the door for anyone who'd like to grab one. Um, but it's an awesome event where, all of the different entities that help support um, affordable housing, whether it be getting someone geared up and ready for it or providing services or providing lending, whatever, everybody's under one roof. You can come and go as you want and ask questions. And um, so there's, we're breaking down the barrier of, gee, who do I call at Habitat or who do I call at Neighbor Impact? Everybody's there. So just go up and ask your question and they'll provide direction. Super exciting. April 17th at LCA. Cool. I need some of those too, because I'll go back to my address. I'll send those out. <laughs> we have a we have a bank branch there now, and they're so excited about this stuff. So oh, cool. Yeah. I like That's the all that I have. The jackets. Oh, we all have these jackets. They're lovely. <laughs> <laughs> Since we're out and about in the community a little bit more. Mm. All right, I think we're adjourned. Well, I just oh, you have something. Real quick, <laughs> oh, yeah, one quick announcement because <laughs> um, I I sign up for um, the housing and community developments notifications, and I got one that Deb Flanagan of Hayden Homes has been appointed to the Thank housing. You. 
I think it's Deb Flagan. Flagan, yep. okay, yeah. sorry. Okay. Um, has been uh, appointed by the governor to the Housing Production Advisory Council, and she's our only person from Central Oregon. Oh, we have Barb. Wow. Oh, we have Barb. Yeah. Oh, Barb, do you got appointed? I didn't see it on the notification. Wow. Oh, I'm. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> sorry. All right. Sorry. She just wants to make a comment. Okay. Anyway, I, I think it's Good exciting note. that she has been, and I hope to tap her. Yeah. Representation. Yes, and I hope to catch your ear about what we're trying to do with middle housing. Um, yeah, that'd be good. Uh, at the uh, informational fair, first story will be present as well. Okay, good. I think I'm, at, well, we'll see. Deb is our, um, the Builders Association president, mm -hmm. um, or just past president, actually, but very, very knowledgeable about all these, all this information. So, yeah, it'll be good. Yeah. Councilor Cam uh, Campbell. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for your good work. Um, yeah, I am the alternate, I believe, is my official position now with the Affordable Housing um, Committee. I believe my words were you can't stop me. I'm still going to be at the Affordable Housing Committee. So just so happy to see you all doing your work. Um, I don't mean to finish us off on a low note, you guys. Um, today, I'm thinking about how Deschutes County has undermined this committee's efforts to build affordable housing time and time again. They pulled a million dollars out of our funds in order to do a land swap over, over on Connors so that they got a million dollars from this committee in order to make it look like they you know, donated the land. They pulled that exact same trick again across this street from the police department where they awesome. took money from the Bend Affordable Housing. And then again on Simpson. Um, and you all are just doing such an amazing job. And I am ob obviously incredibly frustrated after their surprise announcement this morning. and. I just want to tell you all how much I appreciate you and feel like we're just swimming upstream and the stream is is that's fighting against us is a different public agency. I don't know you guys. I'm just I'm just so happy to know that you all are doing such amazing work and how hard you are working for people who are less fortunate than most of us here in Bend. So that's it. Thank you all. Have a great afternoon. Councilor, what was the announcement that you're referring to from this morning? They pulled out of the, the, the South project, South of Les Schwab made an announcement. No, they're not going to do that after all. That's what, oh, geez. Go yeah. ahead. Look, I can do my own research. I just want um, to. So <laughs> thank you. We have been um, trying for many, many months to figure out um, where people can go that live on Hummel Road um, and are camping on Hummel Road. And um, as you heard today, um, City of Bend, we are out of money. Um, we we simply cannot afford to buy another shelter. We simply cannot afford to do this on our own. Um, so we had been working with the county for months and months and months, um, suggesting different um, areas of land um, that might be able to be used, you know, areas of land that might be in, that, that we owned in Juniper Ridge that was surrounded by the county. And, and here's, a, here's another thought of, of, of another area outside of, you know, of the city of Bend. Um, and this, this formerly, uh, former ODOT property um, was, um, sort of picked up by the county because it was closer to services. Um, so uh, last Monday, the county, um, with the, the Coordinated um, Homeless Response Office, had put together um, a plan for a supported camp, which is kind of like um, a managed camp light a little bit, right? So um, would have a fence and would have access to all sorts of basic needs, 
um, and would be, um, you know, lightly managed um, by a service provider. And um, there was some interest from Central Oregon villages that that they could um, possibly take this on. Um, and we were excited to have a place, particularly this was going to be um, a place for medically fragile people that are living on Hummel, of which there are many um, to go. It would have RV spots and it would have um, uh, tent, tent spots as well. Um, and Mosaic Medical had already talked about how they would be out there and, and be able to provide um, as many services as possible. Um, there, like, like, like everything that we do, there is opposition. Um, and um, unfortunately, rather than working um, through the process and and um, you know working on integrating feedback from local businesses and and the the county decided, at, in a total shock to even their staff, um, they thought they were there to talk about a timeline, and um, two of the commissioners just said we we want to drop the ball today. So we are um, extremely disappointed and um, really back to square one um, because we don't have. Um, we don't have any other options right now for people that are living on Hunnell. And um, we have people that are um, in unsafe situations on Hunnell right now, and it's getting worse and worse. Um, we have businesses near Hunnell that are that are are very worried as well. Um, but most important, like we have people there that um, are suffering every day, and we don't have we don't have any place for them to go. Um, and so, we're all sort of left distraught and and not really sure of where to, what to do next um, and what we can work on next. And so we're sort of trying to beg the county um, as the public health body to to um, reconsider or or suggest other land um, that they could that we could use for for this type. Of Thank you. That's my long. No, that's that's long helpful. update on that. It's helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Megan. Um, the only thing I might say. Um, it is just to make super clear, the proposal was never to move everyone from Hunnell to the new location. The new location was, um, I th I'd heard 40 spots, maybe um, people who had been selected for those spots. There was never any, you know, we're just going to tell folks, go ahead and move from Hunnell. It's heartbreaking, you guys. It's really heartbreaking. And to know how hard you all work to see this year after year, how hard you work with such limited funds and knowing that you change lives, literally save lives, and to feel like there are other elected officials who honestly, from my perspective, having seen these other projects go over the years, they're just, the, it's the opposite. Not only are they not helping us, they're literally pulling money away from the good work that you all do. So again, sorry to leave you on a bummer note. I really, I just, you know. Did you have something? Uh, I think I will. Say this. <laughs> <laughs> you sure? I, I think so. <laughs> Anybody else? I don't think so. Not nothing constructive. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Thank you, everyone.